So um, I'd just like to welcome you all to this Open With Care session today. I'm Jane Douglas, I'm the Chief Nurse with Care Inspectorate and um, just a few housekeeping um, mentions. So just to say that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, the Q and there is a Q&A function for you to put in any questions or if you can answer those questions, that would be great too. And our, our team will also answer questions on there um, if you've got questions for discussion later. Um, there's no mics or hands available on this webinar format, so any questions need to go into um, the, the Q&A or the chat. Uh, that would be great. Next, next slide, please. So um, this uh, webinar is, a, we're calling this Growing a Good Life, Maximizing Safe and Meaningful Contact. So what we want to be able to do here today is talk about Open With Care in a way that um, we, we can deliver, um, uh, you me mentioned to you that we will be able to um, share what our expectations are from the care inspector around Open With Care. But we will also be hearing from a care home manager, Katie Jenks, who will be able to share with us her experience of implementing Open With Care. Next slide, please. So just to um, go over the objectives of the session, um, the main aim is to implement Open With Care um, safely, focusing on people experiencing care. Um, but we will not go into de great detail about the guidance um, as it is not new to you um, or, or me, actually. So we want to support you to implement the guidance um, and build your confidence. Live, um, look at the experiences of Open With Care and um, feedback from inspections and the practicalities of implementation of Open With Care. So what does it look like to do this very well um, from a scrutiny insurance um, perspective? And what are the changes in the guidance and what does it mean for, for yourselves? And how is it um, implemented practically? What are the, what are the in, impact on the services, the relationships? Um, as I've said before, we will have a manager speaking about their experience and I heard that yesterday and it is very interesting to hear what um, uh, that they have done and what they've had to overcome. And then there's opportunities to participate in the Q&A. Next slide, please. So one of the areas that I want to talk about is um, uh, self-determination theory is a model of leadership and a model of care and support that I'm very familiar with having used this in my research and self-determination theory looks at the three basic psychological needs of autonomy, competence and relatedness and what um, self-determination theory says and it's a very well researched evidence-based model of motivation and well-being what, what it states is that um, all humans have this in, these innate needs of autonomy, uh, competence and relatedness. And the one need that potentially we maybe haven't been meeting during the pandemic is relatedness because we haven't been able to support that connectivity as well as normal uh, as we did in normal times. So whilst we have used different methods to, to remain connected, it hasn't been in a way that is normal and really what um, is important for us now is to try and get back to that sense of normality around our relationships. Um, if I'm a resident in a care home, I want my relationships to be as normal as possible. My friends, my family, my connections with my groups, my clubs, the people that I live with. Um, I think it's really important that we support our people to do that. Um, what self-determination theory says is that if these three basic psychological needs are not met, then um, you will not experience motivation and well-being. Um, so the idea is to try and maintain all those three basic psychological needs because if one is missing, it can impact on your well-being. So if we haven't been able to support people with their relationships, with their connections, then potentially we could be impacting on their well-being. And I know that we've all done a really good job in maintaining those connections with residents in, in different means, but it really is important to have that human to human contact and that normality of living. So um, this so hopefully today we can we can share those um, ideas with you and and some of the practicalities that you may be able to overcome and hopefully you will feel confident or be able to ask questions if you're not. Next slide, please. So um, we issued a joint statement regarding Open With Care um, with um, other partners um, in order uh, to, to 
state how, how we feel about um, how important it is to ensure that we have um, in place, uh, sorry, facilities for people to, to have um, safe visiting. Um, and with the appropriate measures in place. We expect all the care homes in Scotland to ensure that this is in place by fully implementing Open With Care. Now, I'm not going to read through the, the, the whole um, statement because you will be issued with these slides and you will be able to find that position statement that we have um, published um, when we share the slides with you. And it is very long and I really don't want to, to, to you, you'll lose, you won't get the gist of what it says unless you read it yourself. So, but it is important to be aware that that is our um, position on this, that we would like to see meaningful visits and some normalising. And obviously you, you still have to maintain the safety and COVID is still out there, it hasn't gone away. So it's how we do that with all the knowledge we have now since we've built up over the last 18 months. Next slide, please. So I'd like to pass you on now to Lorraine, um, one of the inspectors. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Afternoon, everybody. Um, sunny year, so I hope it's sunny with you. My name's Lorraine MacDonald. I'm one of the inspectors within the Care Inspector, and I'm going to take you through the next couple of slides. Now, as we know, it's not all about just to implement the guidance with Open With Care. It's about the quality of experience for residents and for their families or people visiting them. Oh, sorry, just playing with all my buttons there. Sorry, this slide is really quite busy, so bear with me. What I'm going to try and do is pull out some of the areas that will be key as we move through beyond level zero and onwards and trying to return to business as usual. As you know, the quality framework has been reviewed and is due to be published very shortly. I'm sure many of you have been involved in the consultation or have been asked to comment on the new framework. The Open with, open with Care guidance sits very nicely within the new quality framework. In fact, the quality indicator 1.4, which is on the screen, people experience meaningful contact that meets their outcomes, needs and wishes is exactly what we're referring to here. The quality illustration shows a very good outcome. So from a scrutiny and assurance point of view, that's what we're going to be looking for. The people are experiencing very good outcomes and we've also got weak outcomes in there. So there's a contrast for you to be able to self-assess yourself against. Although there may be still some tweaks to this guidance and the illustration, the main principles will remain unchanged. So, as I said, this, this slide is very busy, so we'll just pull out a few bits that we should be looking at. The first bit in very good services that we should be looking for is the services should be creative and innovative in, in the ways people, in the way people teeth in this afternoon, sorry. Be creative and innovative in ways for people to stay connected to families, friends and local communities. Be respectful of people's rights to a private and family life. Support visiting that is person-centred, creative, maximises meaningful contact. The staff are proactive and recognise where meaningful contact may be beneficial to people, even when people don't routinely receive visitors. They should be encouraged and support people to get out and about with their families and any restriction placed on time away from the service is supported by evidence and clearly documented. For those weak services, these, this is the type of thing that we would be picking up, which we would be hoping that you would be addressing to move forward and hopefully get further up the, the line, if you like, get further move towards the good and very good services. Staff do not attempt to look for other ways to help people stay connected. They are not overly, they are overly cautious or risk or have a risk averse approach. Friends, members of families or others may not feel welcome when visiting the care home. People do not have a plan to identify how they as individuals will be supported to stay connected. People do not feel included or lack opportunities for meaningful engagement. Visiting arrangements are determined by the service and that any restrictions placed on residents are not based on evidence or informed by local health protection teams. That's what's in the quality indicator 
and the illustration for what you're aiming for. Hopefully a very good side, not the weak side. You know how this goes. OK, so that just gives you a picture of what will be in the, the new quality framework. Next slide, please. OK. We're not going to go into the Open with Care guidance in great detail, as Jane said, because it is not new. But what I just want to do is pick up some key points that we can discuss, because, as you know, the guidance has changed since February when it was first published. OK, so routine visiting. Um, initially, we spoke about designated visitors. Now they are no, no longer recommended or necessary. The number of visitors are no longer restricted or limited. Children can now visit indoors or outdoors. Uh, visiting the care home and outings away from the care home should take place in line with general population COVID-19 restrictions. And there's no limit on the number of outings away from the service. The location and length of visiting in the care home, ideally in the person's own room, if that's what they wish. Time limits for visits should be generous and flexible to meet the needs of the individual. Visits outdoors of windows, in garden pods, marquees, in or indoor with fully screened or adapted rooms that we initially had to put in at the start of all this should not be considered as a, as a replacement to or as a substitute for indoor normal visiting, face to face visiting. Infection prevention and control compliance. Visitors can use a designated toilet. They can have that cup of tea. Refreshments can be offered. So a cup of tea with your mum or your grandma, just ideal because that's what would happen if you were visiting in their own home. Touch, including hand holding and hugging, is all part of the experience and should be supported. Visitors should be allowed to bring in gifts and residence belongings. Personal protective equipment, that old PPE there. Uh, face masks, fluid resistant surgical face masks are recommended for people visiting indoors, but as a person centred approach is recommended for people's individual needs. So if people have, um, you know, they're just can't wear a mask for some reason, um, then that's OK, but we need to start thinking about other steps that could be put in place. So if masks aren't used indoors, then we recommend that physical distancing is maintained. Gloves and aprons are not required as hand hygiene should be sufficient. Visitor testing. All people visiting the care home should be offered a lateral flow device test. It's not mandatory, but we are strongly, strongly encouraging it to take place. And care homes now have the discretion to allow visitors to test at home before they come to the care home, and that's through the community testing routes. Now, if your care home does have an outbreak, um, then you should be moving to support essential and window visits only. And that's all part of that. The health, local health protection team will, will inform you of when that should happen. Excellent. Next slide, please. OK. The lived experience. This is all about outcomes for people. And we recognise that some services have moved on and you'll hear very soon from one of the care home managers and her experiences and. Uh, which is very enlightening, you know, we heard it yesterday and it's really worth listening to. But here are some of the comments that we were given as part of our inspection process from relatives. And um, hopefully these are. Hopefully these, hopefully with with the ongoing of the updates and the guidance and moving towards beyond level zero, all these issues and concerns that were highlighted, which were in June, so actually not that long ago, will become things of the past and all services will embrace open with care and the principles behind it and looking at the outcomes for people um, will be truly embraced into culture and practice. Next slide, please. We speak about indoor visiting a lot, don't we? Um, we all want to ensure the visits take place as safely as possible by continuing to follow the advice. At the beginning of all this, we spoke about the risk assessments and they still should be an 
active part of your assessment. Everybody should have an individual risk assessment and that should be involving residents and families. And the service should also have their own risk assessment and that should be signed off by your oversight group with input from the health protection team. Uh, but you should ha have that in place by now. That should already be a working document that your staff are working to. You should be aware of your COVID, COVID status in the home, whether there's an amber or red pathway, and that will be formed with input from your oversight group and your local health protection team. What we want to do is we want to aim for maximising high quality contact with people. So as I previously said, that term designated visitor is now not recommended or necessary. The total number of visitors at the home can support anyone times not limited now as long as the staff can support the practicality elements of supporting this safely. For example, welcoming people in, checking their documentation, checking their testing, all that kind of stuff. Location wise, again, thinking about the residents own room if they wish, but it may be preferred that they want to meet in some alternative place if they have a larger group of people meeting and that one meter restriction social distancing can't be maintained in their smaller room, then you might like to think about another area for them to meet there. Again, it should be on an individual basis and discussed with the residents and what they want and their needs. Maximising the length of visits as far as the resident wishes and was practically possible. OK, so if somebody wants somebody to stay in the home for four hours, then that's their choice. They should be able to do that. Uh, but if somebody wants a visitors to leave after 15 minutes, again, that's their choice. OK, some homes have booking systems still in place, and I'm sure um, Katie will go on to discuss that. Booking systems, we are a way to publish uh, working on a position statement regarding booking systems. We don't mind them being in place, but what we want them to be as they should be enablers to visiting. They shouldn't be seen as any barriers to visiting. And I'm sure Katie gives some lovely, lovely examples of where it has worked and where it hasn't worked. Found about that. At the end of the day, we are trying to stay safe. We should stay safe. And, and that's an important message for everyone, whether that be staff, relatives, uh, your residents, Anybody coming over that door, staying safe remains important for everyone. This includes hand hygiene, effective hand hygiene, PPE as appropriate, ensuring good airflow as far as reasonably comfortable. We don't want somebody sitting by an open window and a howling gale coming in. And remember the cleaning of surfaces before and after visiting. Thanks very much for listening to me. I'm going to pass you over to Jackie. Um, and Jack will take you through the next couple of slides. Thanks, Jack. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Lorraine said, my name is Jackie Dennis. I'm a senior improvement advisor with the CAM Spectra, and I'm just going to cover um, basically the, um, what's really not in the guidance as such, or has never been in the guidance. Um, and it's really just known in, in a big brother way. It's just to highlight we've really moved on. As you can see from the slide that's on the screen at the minute, um, we've been through the last 18 months, we've, we've had various uh, permutations of uh, how people can visit. So we've had the pergolas outside, we've had the marquees, we've had the bubbles, we've also had the, the window visits. And we can understand that a way back at the beginning. Um, but we've got a lot of mitigating factors now in place with people being double vaccinated. We've got staff who are much more comfortable with using IPC. We've got, I would think the open care guidance is, is a good document. And again, the, the real spirit of the document is, is about getting back to business as usual when it's safe and, and, it's, and sort of like looking at it from the point of view as, you know, we're trying to encourage family members to really engage and, and get back to visiting their, their family members as, as quickly as possible, but in a safe way. So we have been informed that there's been supervised visits and we are aware that some of these practices are still ongoing. So we're now, the Open Care Guidance came out um, just around uh, January time, although we've had various versions pre-Christmas. We're now at the stage where, the, like I said, there's all these mitigating factors in place and we really should be getting back to business as usual. 
However, what we're still finding is, like I said, the supervised visits, there's still restricted access where we have, and I know of one service that we're aware of, you know, that's Monday to Friday visiting and um, and slots are being allocated. And, and it, that is really known in the spirit with the open care guidance. And like I said, there's some very good practices happening out there. Um, but we're now in August, we've had this document for a long time, so we really should be getting back to uh, supporting families, back to business as usual, um, open access as, as, you know, as much as we possibly can, while also keeping uh, people safe now that we're at level zero and beyond. Next slide, please. Um, this is a statistics and again, um, it's it's just an extract from some of the information that gets shared with us. And the blue line there is, is the number of visits or the, the, the visiting or the number of services that are, are basically allowing some form of visiting to, to take place. And the orange line is the number of outbreaks. Um, so again, there was a kind of myth happening out there that the more you increase footfall, um, the more or the higher risk that there'll be, you're, you're opening yourself up to outbreaks. Um, and to be honest, yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, you will, the more footfall that comes through your home, the more um, risk or the higher risk it is that you, you may or may not have an outbreak. The point I'm trying to make though is it's it's your PPE, your hand hygiene, you're keeping the home clean, the testing um, of, of visitors and then being able to demonstrate that they have tested are all mitigating factors. Um, that will allow visiting to take place safely and also make sure that, you know, we, we do not have this sort of exponential rise of outbreaks versus the number of uh, people visiting services. So I just thought I'd put that up there just to show you that although we are seeing a, a massive increase um, and it's fantastic that visiting is taking place or, or services are getting back to some form of business as usual, that there is, has not been that spike that everybody was thinking was going to happen. But let's let's be absolutely clear here. We, we have to remain vigilant. We have to make sure that we're doing things absolutely properly and that we do continue to have these safeguards in place and we do not become complacent. Next slide, please. You'll hear from the care home manager in a second, uh, Katie Jenks. Now, I heard Katie speak yesterday and, and, and she will share with you her experience based on her care service, but a lot of the things that she'll share with you will resonate with you. And one of the things that really came through yesterday was how it's a team and a, a, a whole systems approach and a whole um, involving the family, involving the staff, involving the resident. And you'll hear all about that in a minute. And, and I'm sure you'll be like us yesterday. We were absolutely in awe of what Katie was saying because it was so positive and she has totally embraced the open care guidance. And I think it's you know, for me, it really brings home that it can be done and it can be done safely. But you'll also hear us speak about that, you know, it really is about keeping those mitigating factors um, in the front of your, fo uh, your mind and making sure that you have all these things in place and you are outbreak ready. Um, because again, you'll hear Katie say she's under no illusion. Um, yeah, there is a continued risk, but it's a risk worth taking when, when you see the effects it has in the people experiencing care. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass to Katie Jenks and, and she'll share with you her um, experience. Hi everybody, I'm Katie Jenks and I'm a care home manager at Hillside View and I'm just going to run you through my experience of using Open with Care in my care home um, and how we've used that to take us from using booking systems to open safe care and where we are now with open visits that families just attend the home to do their visits um, and what challenges we faced and how we overcame them to get to where we are today and how, how we stay ready should we end up with an outbreak and how we respond to that really quickly. Next slide, please. So at the start, Open with Care guidelines came out and we'd been waiting for them, we'd all been asking for them. So it was great when they arrived in January. It still brought 
challenges um, going through it. And I'm sure it'll resonate with everybody that works in a care home here. The biggest challenge that I had as a manager was the frequent changes to guidance. Um, you got a piece of guidance, you worked through it, shared it with the staff, the residents, put it in place, came back to the office, and there's an email that change had happened again, and it was back to square one. Um, and it's about when those changes are happening really quickly, how do we keep the staff to where they need to be and, and doing what we should be doing? So that was that was a big challenge to work through. Um, and also the family's interpretations and expectations when the changes happen. So on the day that it was announced that care homes could have visiting again from X state, and again, I'm sure you were all the, in the same position, the phones went off the hook because they heard we can visit and that's what they'd been waiting on for so long as well. And they wanted and to see their loved ones. But they and, and that they missed the rest of the guidance. So again, it became up to us to interpret the guidance and share it with them as well so that we can get the doors open but we can do it in a safe and positive environment for everybody. One of the challenges at Hillside View was the fears and concerns from staff and the fears and concerns were something that I had to look at so that it didn't hold us back and their fears and concerns were really valid so some of them were um, fear and concern for their own health or their family if we ended up in another outbreak are they going to take the virus home um, but the biggest one that came out when we spoke to staff about fears and concerns was the fear of judgment. Um, as we've all seen, care homes haven't had the best light from the media um, during the pandemic. And they were scared that if we, ha we end up in another outbreak, are we going to end up in the papers again? Are we going to end up on the news? And are they going to be judged and blamed for it? So it was working through those processes with the staff um, so that those fears and concerns didn't hold us back. And managing the additional workload, we've already, our workloads have increased um, with COVID coming in, the extra cleaning, the IPC. And now we visit, we had to look at additional cleaning of um, visiting rooms, testing for visitors coming, the, the paperwork and implementing the guidance. So it had, we had to work through these. Next slide, please. So how did we approach these changes at Hillside View? So what we done was um, open communication was a big key um, for us at Hillside View and I should probably put residents, residents at the top there because um, that was key for us. So open communication with residents, relative and staff. And for me, open communication meant me not just speaking to them and saying this is what we need to do. It's getting everybody's opinions, everybody's views, what do they want and pulling it together. And first and foremost, what did the residents want? It was their home, it's their environment, and there was absolutely no point of us putting something in place that then it wasn't what they wanted. So we had to find out what they wanted first and foremost and then start working through that. We also had to have some really frank and honest discussions um, with some of our families where the perceived risk that they wanted to take um, could have been greater than the benefits. And, and again, I'm sure you've all experienced these. Um, and one of our one of the examples that I've got at Hillside View that we had to work through was as soon as the guidelines had came out, the one of the sons of one of our residents wanted to take his mum home to his house. Um, and his house was two hours away from the care home. So we were recommending that he had a visit either closer to the care home and in the care home. And he became really frustrated and believed it was because COVID. Um, but in actual fact, taking COVID aside, it was his it was his mum's health needs and care needs. And because we maybe never get the communication right for the start, he became really frustrated um, and there were some really heated conversations between the staff. So we had to um, have a sit down conversation, a really frank conversation. What was he wanting? What was his mum wanting? And what can what can we do to make that safe? And when we had that open and honest conversation with this family member, what it transpired was that um, he was feeling guilty for the time that he'd lost with his mum during COVID and he wanted to try and gain some of that back. And he didn't like the at the start when it was supervised visits because he, he didn't have any personal time with his mum. 
He also had resentment for the staff, and that's where some of his, his frustrations were coming when he was speaking to the staff, because the staff were building a relationship with his mum and getting to see his mum every day, the most important person in his life, and he couldn't do it. And through having that frank and honest conversation, which sometimes we don't want to approach, we actually built that relationship back up, um, got him having really meaningful contact with his mum, um, and he was able to celebrate his our 80th birthday out in the garden with the rest of the family, which was great to see. So it's about facing these challenges when they come up and, and how do we work through them and take them head on sometimes. We also had to challenge our own thinking and basis for fears in decision making. Um, and this was sitting down and saying, well, why are we making certain decisions? Why do we not want to open the doors? Why do we not want to have visiting in the rooms? Is it because there's a genuine risk or is it because we're scared of something happening or, or is it other factors? So we had to look at why we were making decisions and not just make decisions. And I think for me, that was learning how to um, how to not stop responding, stop reacting and start responding um, and, and just flipping that in its head. Next slide, please. So what did we consider? So the first um, big thing that we looked at was whose risk is it? Again, through COVID, um, things have kind of flipped in their, their head a wee bit um, and we've been making decisions because we've had to, guidelines have came out, we've had to shut the doors and the care homes, we've had to do certain things to keep people safe. Um, but looking at Open With Care, one of the things we challenged ourselves at Hillside View is looking at whose risk is it. When the staff were concerned about bringing a risk in, Whose risk is it? Is it the resident's risk? This is their home. We come in that front door every day as a guest into their home to facilitate their life. And the risk needs to, we need to look at what risk the residents um, who live there want to take. And we explored that with the staff by looking at over Christmas time, um, we were allowed to meet in small groups to meet our family for Christmas. We were allowed at that point to go to um, shopping centres, maybe have a coffee with a family member. And they were there, but we we were making a decision to take these risks. So if we can make these decisions, then we need to support the residents to decide what risks they want to take in, in their life and, and how do we promote that with them. We also had to consider what do the residents and the family and friends want? And we spoke about that. I spoke about that a wee bit before. Would they, that's why we're here first and foremost. So there's no point in interpreting the guidance one way. And then we take it to them and they want something totally different. So by doing that at the start, um, it kind of saves some of our workload because we were getting it right for them from the beginning. And we set up a resident committee and all the guidelines when it came out then went to them as well. So they were seeing it, they were seeing what we were working with and they could interpret in their own way and let us know what parts of it they wanted, what parts they didn't, where they were willing to take risk. And then we could look at the bigger factors for the wider community of the care home. And what did we need to change to put things into place to make it work? We know there's been a lot of changes and there's a lot of workload on the care homes, um, but COVID's here to stay and we had to learn to adapt. Um, and it was easy, it was an easier option for me and the staff to say, well, it's too much, we can't fit it in. That isn't good enough. Um, I'm here as a fa to facilitate this for the residents to give them a better quality of life. So what do we need to change? And the view we took with that from is it's not about the changes having to fit into our box. That's the box it's here and we need to adapt to fit into that. Um, and I think that's that's the base of a good and if we can get our team to, to that level, it opens up care and changes care, not just within COVID, but as, as we move further forward. And what support do the staff in the home need? And what did this look like in real time? Because again, when I was speaking to the staff um, at any meeting, it came up, well, we need support. And when I would look at that in his head and say, well, what support? And sometimes you get blank faces because we would say support, but we hadn't actually really thought about what support do we need? And in order for somebody else to support us, we need to know what that looks like for us. Um, so one of the things that I asked for support for at Hillside View um, from my company was we were using pre-pandemic um, 20 hours wellbeing staff 
And obviously a big part of um, when we're into families and when we're starting to open up is the well-being of the residents. So the support at one of the support networks I asked for was to increase that um, to two full-time um, well-being coordinators. And that's what we've got in the home now. So it's it's knowing what support you need um, and asking for it rather than just saying support. Next slide, please. So what did we do at Hillside View? Um, so speaking with the families, one of the things they came up with, so we were frustrated with getting information and things changing. And when we were having the frank and honest conversations with the families, they were frustrated as well. So my frustrations for other organisations was their frustration for me. So how do we change that? So we set up a relative email group where the relatives get blank copied into that. Um, so they're getting real live information. And we also agreed with the families um, that we would take three to four days to go through um, any new guidance came out. And that was to allow us to respond and stop reacting. Because to respond, we need time um, to process it. But that wasn't just from us. So when a new guidance came out, um, whether it's open with care or anything else with Scottish Care, the care inspector, um, as long as it's not for care home managers only, I'll put it on the relatives email group and it goes to our resident committee. And we take that three pronged approach. We all go through it, see what bits we pick out and it's important and then come back together and say, right, what is going to work for Hillside going forward? We also used Sway to do monthly, monthly newsletters and this was something that one of your families had seen and recommended. Um, and when I went on and looked at it, it's free to use. It's um, on Microsoft and Andy can access it. And it was a lifesaver. We've all done newsletters and if Andy's like me, it took me hours to get a newsletter pulled together. But Sway is really easy. It formats it for you. It makes it look really professional. But what I liked about it is you can change it into different formats for who you're targeting. So if you've got a resident that needs an easy read version, you can uh, Sway can automatically um, convert it to that for you. Uh, so that or a pure text one. So it can be adaptable. So you're not having to do three or four. It's it's one newsletter and you can change it. We were doing newsletters for families before anyway, but we decided as well that let's get a resident bulletin going and a staff bulletin. And again, that's about keeping everybody in the loop in communication and when things were changing so that the information is there in live. What's also really good about Sweet is it gives you an email link. So you can end it that's in the email group, you can send that straight through that. So we get 30 families that joined up to our email group and we've got 54 residents currently in the home. So straight away that's um we only need to send 24 paper copies out. So again, it's about learning to use our time wisely um, and the best of it because it's it's precious. We also encouraged our staff to use the HC1 um, staff support line to go through their anxieties and worries. Um, their anxieties and worries are, are really real, but sometimes as the care home manager, I wasn't always the best person to support them with that either because I'm going through the pandemic as I use. So sometimes we are not best placed to take them through that. Sometimes they need to have somebody outside to work through. So we really promoted that. We also promoted um, all the other ones that came out, so the local HSCP um, gave a support line. Um, there was free yoga classes that came out. I think it was the HSCP or one of our hospices. And it was signposting the staff and giving them all of that. So then they can pick what bag they need and what they can use at, at the time. And not being afraid to tap into these services because they're there. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time. One of our big things was involving everyone in the decision making. Um, and if anything changed, we went to the residents first and by having everybody involved in the decisions, it meant they were part of it. They knew what was happening. Nothing was a surprise. And that was really big as we worked through Open We Care to open the doors again. Um, and, and how do we go from our visitors book and a designated visitors room for half an hour to where we are the now? And that's involving everyone on that process. So they, they know um, there's a plan, there's a way forward and they know what we're going to do. Next slide, please. So what did this look like in real time at Hillside View? Um, so we started really slow. So when the guidelines came out and we took everybody through it and we decided what our path was going forward. So we started slow, but had um, points where we had to stop and reflect and say, are we, how are we going to move on next? 
Start and slow allowed us to reassure everybody that what we were doing was safe. It allowed us to identify changes to what we were doing before moving to the next stage and look at what are the benefits for that and what are not and, and how can we start to adapt and change them. And to keep um, me accountable, accountable at the home, um, from that I say every day I it was a two week. Um, so let's look at this in two weeks time. If things change before that, we can go back to the table. But it was a maximum of two weeks and then we reviewed it, we got feedback and seen where can we go next, what, what is our plan. And while we started small, we had our end goal um, sitting there was that getting to where we are the now with open visits and, and keep on that path. We had to have some really honest and frank conversations with families that maybe wanted to go beyond the guidelines um, at the start when we weren't ready for that risk. And again, that was part of involving them in the process and how we worked through these. And again, we knew before that we know our families well. So we knew the ones that we might need to support more, the ones that we'd have to have these conversations with, um, the ones that pick things up easier. And it's about it's about knowing that um, within our care homes and responding appropriately. And it allows us so that we don't have that one size fits all. We can tailor it um, because what we found at the start when it was that one size fits all, it actually made our, our workload harder. It made life in the care home harder. Um, and one of the big things was when we had the visiting book, um, we've got two floors and there was a visiting room on each of them and it's portable phones. So if somebody if upstairs was downstairs and they take a call and they forgot to put it in that visitor book, somebody else books in and we were double booked. So we found it more of a hindrance. And as we started to move forward, the first week was really, really busy. With visitors coming into the home um, because the doors were opened and they could come and see gran and grandpa, mum, dad, son, daughter. Um, but as once they'd seen it and they, they knew what was going on behind the doors in the care home, um, things things have slowly settled down um, and we're back to our normal kind of trickle throughout the day of people coming to visit the home. We had to rethink our way of working. Covid's here to stay um, and for me, I had to stop resisting the changes and I start and start adapting myself and I had to change my mindset from, yep, my job title is a care home manager, that's that's what's there. But I had to relook at my role as being a facilitator. I came in the door in the morning um, to facilitate a good life for the residents that live at Hillside View and that is my goal and my aim every morning. So I had to stop resisting change and looking at ways of, well, what do we need to change? We're in a new environment, we're in a new era and a time. Um, and looking at our workload day to day, what, what can we take away? What can we add in? What needs to stay? And involving the team in that um, and, and adapting for where we are now. And I think I touched on it a wee bit, taking requests from families and residents individually. And that comes down even now when the way we do our testing. So our families, we are now in a position where our families get have a pack with all the paperwork that they might need for the different type of visits if they're taking them out or they're, they're having an indoor visit or a garden visit. Um, and they test their self, the majority of them, before they come to the care home and they log on the app. Um, the LFD registering kit and select outside view. So it means when they come to the home, they can show us that their test's been done, they've got their paperwork there, we're just running through it, making sure it's it's fine, and they can get right up um, into the bedroom. So it's it's become a five minute um, process um, streaming, streaming through. That doesn't work for everybody, and we've got two families that we do support with um, testing for two very different reasons. One of our families was really open and honest and says, I can't test myself, I can't do that at the back of my throat. Um, and he wants to have it right because he wants to keep mum safe. So we, we test for him and we've got another relative um, who doesn't have a smartphone or access to a tablet and he's very honest and says even if he gave me it I wouldn't know how to work it. So he comes up to the care home as well and gets tested and log, we log the test. So they're the only two families that and it's not a booking system we just ask them to phone up so that we can make sure that they, we've got staff there at the time and it's not maybe a meal time um, or a medication round so that we, we can support them as promptly as we can. 
We've also got outside visiting in because Hillside View, the way the gardens are, and again, this was a choice that came for the residents. They didn't want another outdoor area where families could visit. They wanted the majority of the garden for them, and quite right, it's their home. Um, so if there's a garden visit, then that needs to be booked in. And, and again, it's just so that we don't double book. But for coming into the care home to visit, there's there's not a visiting system anymore. And we do have some residents that go outside with their families. And that's where we learned whose risk is it um, really coming in, especially Hillside Views in Renfrewshire. So at one point, the prevalence was really increasing and it was having that conversation with the residents of, you know, the prevalence is increasing, you, you're aware of the risks. Um, one of our, when they were going out, was they had to test and protect the app open on their phone so that if they came in contact with MD and they get pinged and they were aware that if they get pinged, they would need to isolate for the 14 days. And if we had two that wanted to take that risk because that was meaningful contact for them going shopping with mum um, rather than uh, coming into the, the, the care home and into the room. That wasn't the type of visit she wanted. So it's taking each individual one at a time and not trying to do that one size fits all. Um, we were really open and honest around um, decisions we were making and why we were making them. Um, if people don't always agree with our decisions, but if they know the rational uh, rationalisation behind it and that we're involved in it, it makes it easier to understand and move forward. We reviewed staff rotas across all departments. And again, it wasn't just focusing on the care rotas. It was looking at um, a housekeeper. So instead of everybody starting eight o'clock in the morning, they now stagger so that we've got somebody in right through to eight o'clock at night. Should we need a room um, decontaminated because somebody's been in visiting? Um, and, and it's looking at that as, as a whole home. So what do we need as a home and not just about providing care? Because all of it factors into care and the well-being of the residents. So for me, it was looking at um, all of the departments so they were providing the best well-being for the residents. Next slide, please. And what is that achieved for us? So at Hillside View, we've seen um, really positive impacts now, um, now that we've got open visiting and now that the relatives are coming in the home. We've, we've definitely noticed a better quality of life for our residents. We have less weight loss. Um, and one of the for one of our residents, um, his daughter comes up at meal times and she'll assist dad with his dinner. And that was something we'd done before the pandemic. Um, he he eats really slowly, and she she supports him, and it makes it a meaningful um, experience for her, but also supports the staff as well because that's a, that's time that then we can focus on somebody that maybe doesn't have somebody up and support them with their weight. Fewer stress and distress events um, and on reflection, looking back, it's very clear that as we locked down the home, um, stress and distress started increasing and we can see now it was that loss of contact from their family. So there's a lot fewer of that now that they're seeing their relatives um, coming into the home. And we've now we've got less residents being referred to GP for low mood um, and with residents, I've got a younger person's unit um, and a lot of them were having to get referred for their mood being really low because they were used to being out in the community and were now slowly getting their medication reviewed and off antidepressant medication and anxiety medication. So that has a massive impact on their quality of life. We've got staff engaging with families face to face again, which is excellent. Saves a lot of time with all the best will in the world trying to do 50 phone calls every day to update people. It doesn't happen or they don't become personal. Um, whereas now when somebody's in visiting, we can run those things past. Look, mum's not ate very well today, but she ate really good yesterday. That face to face interaction has been absolutely invaluable for staff and the residents. And families being involved in the direct care and support and they're seeing what's been going on behind the closed doors because it's been scary for the families as well. They, the doors were shut, they weren't allowed in to visit and then they're hearing the negativity in the news. So getting the doors back open, letting them see what's going on behind. Um, and we now have a staff team that's more open and considerate to change. They work different. Um, they will challenge new ideas. They'll no longer accept that that's why we need to do stuff. And that that fed into that open and honest communication when things were on the table and we're saying, well, if you don't know why you're doing something, you need to ask and you need to find out. Um, because you also, uh, as delivering the care, need to know what's going on. So we've got a, a staff team that is 
more responsive to change and coming through this um, once COVID's away it's putting us in an absolute uh, it's not going away but once COVID in our homes isn't in an outbreak status it's allowing us then to use that time to look at other ways that we can use that change effect um, to improve improve life even further and we've got a more positive environment for resident staff, um, to, for our residents, our staff and our relatives now that visiting's opened. Um, the smiles on their face, you know, before I came to do this presentation, we had a new resident that came into the home and our daughter just came to visit her and walked into her room and the smile for year to year for that resident seeing her daughter for the first time um, in a few weeks because she'd been isolating um, and the impact of that on the daughter, it's it's wonderful to see and, and that's, what, that's where we need to be. Um, and bearing in mind that we're just ready for an outbreak to happen. Next slide, please. So what have we learned through this experience? We've learned that it's okay. Um, it's it's okay to be concerned as long as we don't unpack there. Um, work through it, move on. Um, work through our concerns, go to the next bit. It's important allow, to allow time to process new information ideas rather than just jumping in. Um, I've always been really guilty of that. Here we've got this, we need to do it. And that wasn't working during COVID. So I've had to retrain myself. OK, we're taking it away, we're looking at it and then we'll go back with a fresh pair of eyes. And if I couldn't see how it would work, go and speak to somebody else and see what their ideas were around it. We need to look at new ways of working. If what we're doing now doesn't fit into what we need to do, we need to change. We're here to facilitate the care for the residents, so the residents don't need to change and everybody else involved in the care environment needs to change for what that resident group at that time wants. And we need to invest our time in the right areas, um, not getting bogged down with why things aren't working. And again, I think that was part of where we were at that time with COVID. Um, and one of the things I had to realise was that if there was other managers who were negative because they were in the same position that I was in. They weren't the people to speak to that day because all it would do was take me further down that road. I had to go to somebody different that would maybe challenge me, say, why are you thinking like that? And so it's knowing ourselves as well, knowing ourselves as managers and care providers and nurses on the floor so that we can recognise that for us and we can change and adapt. Communicating with everybody involved, it's important to prevent unnecessary frustration. If people know what's going on, the frustration becomes a lot less. And one of the big, big nuggets for us in the Care Home at Hillside View was that everyone involved, when you look back and you reflect, we've had we're being scrutinised from everybody. We've got HSCP doing audits, we've got Care Inspectorate, we've got our own internal governance and sometimes you think what's going on. But again, when you look at it, we flip it and change how you think things. Every single person in all these organisations that are involved in this, we're all here for the same thing. Every single one of us want to make care better for residents. Um, we're all just coming at it from different angles. So if we can take bits from all of us and add it in, that's going to benefit the residents. That that and, and that's the nugget. That's why we're here. That's why we signed up for this job. Um, and it provides the best care for the residents. But at the same time, being ready for an outbreak, I'm under no illusions that an outbreak's never going to happen again in Hillside View. We did have an outbreak in November and worked through it. So we've got our contingency plans are ready. We've got our store covered with all of the extra stuff we need. Um, with, with the relative support group and email, it means we can get families really quickly. We've, we've learned for that. So it's reflecting and learning, not living in the past. Tomorrow's not here yet. We need to plan for it. But what are we doing today? How, how are we making care better today? Um, and, and that's my goal and my strive and the, the staff strive every day. If we can make one thing that bit better um, and open the visits and, and take it that wee bit further, but keeping safe. And if we do something every day, by, by the time we get to the end, um, we've achieved big things that the small steps should soon add up. Thank you very much for listening to me and listening to my experience. Um, and I'll cash you back to Lorraine. Thanks very Thanks. much, Katie. Um, it's lovely to hear in practical terms how you've implemented the guidance. And I know it hasn't been easy. It's not been easy for anybody out there, but uh, there have been a number of challenges. But it's lovely to hear how, you know, often guidance is issued and it looks great on paper. But it's the hard work of people that actually get implemented thinking about the outcomes for the residents and their relatives as well. Next slide, please. 
saying that, you know, as we move forward into beyond level zero, as, as the government are calling it now, we all need to fight that fight of to ensure complacency doesn't set in. OK, we need to stay safe and we need to think about becoming outcome ready. But the changes in testing, the continued rollout of the vaccination programme, all of them the play their part. But we must continue to follow good practice, follow good hand hygiene, uh, follow good cleaning, make sure your homes are clean and well maintained and ensure equipment's spot on, but be outbreak ready. Now, the, there is that outbreak ready checklist, which I'm sure you've all got access to, and that's on the screen at the moment there. It's in the centre and there's links available for that. We know outbreaks will take place. That's bound to happen. You know, the commission, commission community uh, transmission rates are on the rise quite significantly and we're sure outbreaks will happen. But the thing is, how do you recover from that? We want to prevent your service going into that, becoming that risk averse service. OK, so thinking about are you ready for an outbreak? And once it's over, once you've done your 14 days, we've had no more new cases, everybody's recovering. How do we get back to business as usual? And that's a, that's a continuing challenge for everyone. Next slide, please. Saying that, what are we doing all about this? You know, what are the care inspectorate doing to support you with open with care and meaningful contact? As you know, we are supporting the implementation of the guidance. Hence, we're doing one of these webinars just now and the quality framework. We're ensuring that the visiting within the services is in line with the Scottish Government guidance, public health guidance and the health and social care partnership and standards are in amongst all that. And we're picking that up on inspection. We've got the quality illustration. It's coming through now, so that enables you to assess your own service against the illustration. Are we very good? Are we good? Are we weak? I hope not, but you know, it gives you something to benchmark yourself against. And we're also ensuring at inspection that you've got these support plans in place for people. They're meaningful and they reflect people's outcomes regarding meaningful contact with the people that they love and who they want to see within their own homes. Next slide, please. We've talked an awful lot about guidance out there for you. And you know by now we've got the COVID compendium and the COVID team's coming to an end within the next week. I hate to say that because I've no idea where the time's gone. So within the next week, we're coming to an end, but the compendium will remain on our website and that will give you hyperlinks to all the most up to date information that's out there for you. There's other useful sites on the screen there for you to see. And again, when you get a copy of these slides, they're all hyperlinked as well. So very useful for you just even to nip into what did they say about this? What are you know, what information can I give my relatives? All that information is in there for you. Um, I'm now going to pass you back to Jane just to finish off and say thank you very much for listening to us. Back to you, Jane. Next slide. Uh, so thank you very much, Lorraine, and thank you again for um, the presentations and the discussion and the talk actually on uh, the care home um, and how you've managed to open with care and the challenges that you've overcome. So it's just to say, um, does anybody have any questions? Um, in the, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A, um, but has anybody got any more questions? If they would like to type them in there, um, we can have a look at those. I think that there is one question there, whether it's a question or a statement, but um, it's about um, the, the way the protective layers are being peeled away. Staff are still worried about COVID and overcoming trauma at the last period, fearful of an outbreak, um, and that needs to be listened to, that fear. Um, it's not proving easy. Just there's a feeling that staff input has been overlooked and that an outbreak is incredibly tough to work through mentally, physically and emotionally. Um, I don't know if 
if anybody wants to, to, to make a comment on that, Jackie or Lorraine. Okay, come in, Jane. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hi, Jane. Um, I think it's, it is important to recognise that we have been through a tough time, and I think I said that when I was presenting, and it's about using the resources that are there for us. So at Hillside, we looked at the local hospice actually provided um, bereavement counselling for any staff that struggled with the death journey, because we, we had an outbreak where we lost a few of our residents um, and they provided counselling um, for the staff so they could work through it and they could work through it in an environment that was away from the care home as well. Um, and that's why we looked at the different support that was there because a one size fit all approach doesn't work for the staff either. So that's we looked at the different um, support lines, whether it was through the HSCP ones, the company ones, um, the counselling that the hospice could offer us or the yoga classes because everybody responds different. Um, and having those open and honest conversations because we had them during COVID, after an outbreak and when we started to implement an open with care. And it's sharing that because, again, we've we've all managed it differently. And I think this is what I, I really appreciate about allowing, you, allowing me to be part of this, because I think if, as care home managers and staff within the care homes, if we start sharing the experiences more, somebody's been through it. So we don't always need to reinvent the wheel. We Somebody can maybe signpost us as somewhere that, that we never thought. So I think it's opening that community and saying, yep, it's been really, really hard. The, the press haven't supported us, but we can be our own supporters and we can start to show what's going on behind the closed doors. And with op implementing Open With Care, that's what our families are starting to see now, um, that it's not all been negative and there's been good stuff and we're celebrating that so that the staff are getting that celebration. and. We're celebrating the staff coming through as well. So this year for me, it's been really important to if staff have a birthday that we do something special, we get them their flowers or, you know, we things. And I know it sounds small, but that is the stuff that lifts staff spirits on a day to day basis um, and bring, brings that teamwork on. Um, but I think it's reaching out and saying that, yep, that there's other stuff out there that we can look at. Um, it, it's happened. We, we can't go back and change it, but we need to reflect on it so that it doesn't affect another outbreak. And what can we learn the now so that when my home comes back into outbreak, I already know where the, the signposts are. Thank you for that. I think you said you were outbreak ready, and I think that's important. And I think you also said, which I noted down yesterday, is whose risk is it anyway? And I, I think that is really important to bear that in mind and, and, and the impact that has had on people who are living in care homes. I think it is trauma causing, and I don't think we can underestimate the impact on the care homes and the staff and the people who live there and the people who work there and, and the press interest in care homes and, and the impact that has had. And when I was working in the care home last year, I did actually comment on that quite a lot through the press and the media. I think it's really important we do recognise that and acknowledge it. Um, but, but, but it's how we work through this because COVID is still here and it's unlikely to go away. So it's how we build that confidence back up with, with our care homes and our managers and our staff. Um, I don't know if anybody else wanted to say anything around that, Jackie or Lorraine. Yeah, I, I'd like to um, probably respond to the, the comment around the interesting figure graph. All right, yes, yeah. We, we totally acknowledge, you know, that the anxiety that this is causing and we, we're probably more, um, we are under no illusions that outbreaks will happen. What we're interested in is how you respond to that. And like Katie was saying earlier, it's about being outbreak ready. It's about getting back to business as usual as quickly as you can, because we're under, like, we absolutely acknowledge that as, as the football increases, we're increasing the risk. And, and we're already seeing some of that sort of, as, as you see the community transmission rates go up. And we were just at a meeting earlier on where they were, they were highlighting these things, but we have to remember we're in a different place. We've got staff who are really highly trained now working in services who know what they're doing. And it's about that preparation. And again, if, a, if you're unlucky enough to have an outbreak, which, you know, if you haven't had an outbreak up to now, you know, it's one of those things, it's about taking your staff through it, getting the outbreak ready checklist from the HPS website and just walking through it so that everybody knows what to do if they happen to, you know, get a, a, a notification from Public Health Scotland or whatever to say that, you know, you've, you've definitely got an outbreak in the home. It's about 
how you communicate that, like Katie was saying earlier, it's how you manage people's expectations and it's how quickly, you know, you can get yourself back onto that even keel to get your visiting doors back open again and you'll go back into that whole risk aversive um, approach. Because again, like we're saying, COVID is here to stay. We need to learn to live with it, but we also need to acknowledge, you know, it's human behaviours that are driving spread. And the more that we can put in place in a, in a sort of um, balanced way around cleaning, and then that's where the, the Care Home IPC manual will come in and the safe environment and uh, cleaning schedules, the more we keep staff focused on the, the good practice and how they can really support visiting, but in a sort of enabling way rather than seeing it as a negative way, then you know that there's no there's no way there's no reason why we kind of keep moving forward and basically facing the challenges as they pop up. So I do take the point about the graph, you know, we were in a sort of softly, softly as we move towards um, open care and, and really implementing the principles of it. But we're, we're at that stage now, we really should be just, you know, implementing it, working with it and, and being outbreak ready. And that's the best, best advice I can give you is really just, it's like running be many drills probably with your staff as well, just to make sure they're all aware of what should happen and when, and, and you know, have your own communication um, system set up. So I'll shut up now, I feel as if I've overdone that. That's fine, thank you. I wanted to just um, make sure that we read this one out because it's a it's a question for Katie. Um, you speak about having systems in place to support your staff, giving information on helplines, etc. Do you have someone you can talk to for your support and own mental health and well-being, and does it help you? Um, hi there. Um, yeah, and I think that's when I think I spoke about it a wee bit about knowing ourselves. Um, and for me during this outbreak was knowing when there were certain people that I knew I wouldn't speak to during that time um, if I was in a bad day because it would pull me down further because they were maybe in an outbreak and they weren't the right person. Um, and also I know myself when I need to stop, have a day off um, and that I'm in a, a really good position um, with my company and my boss that I can say I've, I've hit a brick wall, I need to have a day off tomorrow, the diary's clear, um, I'm going to take some time back. And it, d different things don't work for everybody, so it's knowing, knowing what works for you. I've learned through the years as a manager what works for me. Um, it's taking time back, it's having a day off, going away with the family, um, or sometimes just taking a half an hour and walk around the block. So it, it's knowing you. Um, there is plenty of resources out there, but if you don't use what's right for you, it's not going to work. So, and, and I think that's, it's the, and it, as I had this conversation with my staff as well. We can signpost every day to different support that's out there. Yoga is not going to work for somebody. Um, Counselling maybe not work for the other person. So what works for you? Because if you know when you're starting to get stressed, I would rather a staff member came and says, look, I am really exhausted. Can I get a switch shift swab and take, of course, we'd prefer that than staff burning out. And, it, and it's about having that open communication with our teams so that we're, we're one team. We've all just got a different role in that team. And my role in that team is the facilitator. Um, and I, I've got people above me that I can step in and speak to in different organisations as well that I can go. And sometimes, even for support, it's about when my head gets into that negative place as well. I know the person I need to go to that will pull me out of that and say, right, come on. That's not where we are. We need to go here. And it's knowing who, who these people are for you as well. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. And it's it's important, I suppose, that you're able to recognise yourself when you need that help. And, and that's really important to have that insight into your own self. And sometimes when you're really busy and you're very stressed and you're taking on board all the um, issues that are happening in a care home, you might not recognise it yourself and you might have to rely on your colleagues to sort of notice about your wellness and your well-being. Um, there, there is a question here about Operation Copper. I'm not I'm not able to answer that question. I, I, I empathise with the concern around that. Um, I'm not sure the care inspectorate can do anything around that, but we can raise that out with this meeting um, to say that it has been raised, um, but obviously not something we could answer here. So I think Stephen has um, asked if you could use the evaluation form above, which he's posted in the Q&A. Um, in fact, Jennifer's posted it in the Q&A to give us feedback on today's webinar. That would be great. And 
If there are not any further questions, I'd just like to thank everybody who's taken part today. It's been really informative. And again, to thank you to Katie to taking time out of her busy schedule to, to present her, her um, knowledge of Open With Care and what she's done in her came and, sh and share that experience with us. I think it's been really helpful. So a big thank you for you all for attending as well. Thank you. Bye.